problem and how coronavirus infection or SARS-2 infection is defined. Next. So this is uh, the total number of cases we have now. This is an old slide in that it was, it's like 10 minutes old and probably <laughs> were much more than 115 and 855. Uh, we have an interactive map later on to show you how this has spread uh, around the world. Next. Okay, so last time we met, uh, this is where we were. So this is the evolution and the timeline of what happened uh, since the middle of December. And I, I would like to point out that um, the information that is becoming available uh, from various uh, centers and from the countries that are affected actually point out that some of the initial uh, conclusions, you know, maybe not accurate, and that appears that the virus maybe can have emerged in November. And so, actually, the virus has been circulating for much longer than, than what we think. And so this means that there's much more of it around than what we act, than what we know. Um, okay, so Italy is experiencing a dramatic situation because Italy is the the country, the Western country, which is most uh, affected. Uh, Italy has a national health service which covers uh, all Italian citizens and all Italians, and, and regardless of their uh, social or financial condition, everybody has access to the health service. And of course, um, the increase in number of cases has um, created a lot of um, anxiety, a lot of fear, and um, the country is really under shock. It is under shock. Next. Italy becomes the most affected country in Europe. Next. We have a little surprise, which I think could be of interest. There was one dog that, pos that tested positive in Hong Kong. The reason I say this, and I will pick it up later, is because we don't know if this virus could eventually spill back into animals. Um, and just uh, a few days ago, we have had the first two cases in Florida, and Sonia Rasmussen will, will talk to us about the situation in the United States. This is the mortality rate we have up to now. I would like to say that I am unsure that the collection of the data and the definitions are harmonized. And I think that this is one of the biggest problems that we have at the moment, because some countries are being stigmatized and, uh, and, and therefore the notification is what it is. Next. Uh, soon after Florida. And I would just like to remind all the young people in the room that Florida actually has a lot of elderly people because it's a place where people retire. No, no. So, so let's think about it. Huh? Okay. Um, pardon? Like in Italy. Come in Italia. Come in Italia. Uh, New York State went <coughs> into emergency and yes, or sun Saturday. Sorry, I can't remember what day it is. Italy is under lockdown. So, Everybody is asked to stay at home. Nobody, you, you can only move for very, very important reasons. Uh, medic, if you need medical attention, if you have something that you really cannot let go, if not, everything else is being either um, interrupted or postponed or done remotely. Next. This is uh, the toll we have now. Next. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, remind us of how it went. Uh, we can say that the first diagnosis in people was around early December, and this obviously came from uh, the, li the, the live animal market. Um, it then spread inside the city of Wuhan and inside the province, and then um, we, we, we still think that a significant amount of virus next got out 
of, um, of, of that province and reached other parts of the world, uh, including China, including Europe, and including the rest of the world. However, we still don't have a patient zero either for the Chinese outbreak. Actually, we don't even have a patient zero for the Italian outbreak, probably because the dynamics of infection are being magnified in Italy and they're not being looked at with the same granularity in the rest of Europe. And so we don't know. We don't know what, what is how much the virus is circulating. Next. Okay, uh, as I said, there, there are some, some, there is some evidence that the virus might have circulated before. I even seen some reports. I don't know. Uh, most of the cases were associated with uh, with the let's say the emergence of the virus were linked to the sea, to the seafood market. Okay, so um, managing an outbreak with a highly transmissible virus is uh, very very complicated, especially if you consider the speed at which we are able to move, we are able to travel, and uh, uh, we are able to to do things, actually. And so, of course, uh, the virus emerged in China, and there are, at the moment, what we see, there are three lineages or three main branches of this virus, one going south towards Australia, one which went towards Europe, and then another one which entered uh, the United States, North America. Next. This gives you an idea of how complicated it is to uh, map these cases. And I would like to, um, to stress that a lot of the cases are non-symptomatic. And so what we see is not a real picture of the situation. Right? And of course, global travel does the rest. Right? OK, so what happened in Italy? We are currently the country in Italy, in Europe, which is most affected. And we are fighting with Korea to be the second or the third after China. Ah, Alexa. <laughs> Did you see what I said? I said a word, and Alexa answered me. Wow. Alexa answered me. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't say I'm going to kill my husband. <laughs> Don't believe it. Sorry, Alexa. Hi. <laughs> Alexa. OK, so what happened in Italy? As I said, uh, Italy because of intensified testing, because of the reaction of a very good health, public health system, has actually really been uh, uh, on the front of this outbreak. And uh, it has, I think, done an excellent job. But I also believe that this has backfired on the country, because I'm sure that a lot of you have seen that picture of the CNN, which implies that Italy is infecting um, the rest of the world. And uh, I am determined as an Italian, but not only as an Italian, as a scientist, to, to show that this is not true because Italy is part of the European outbreak and we uh, have contributed to the spread of this virus, like, just like many other countries. And that's why we have to work together at a European net level to fight this. Next. This is an Italian, I saw it this morning, uh, last night, and I sent it to Costanza. Okay, so this is the people who have been hospitalized in intensive care, okay, in Italy from the 25th of February to the 9th of March. The orange line on the top is the maximum capacity of the system. So what Italy has done is, is it has increased the number of beds in intensive care because they are afraid that they're not going to make it. And just for those of you who, who don't have clear the, the domino effect of this situation, if you have to reorganize a hospital and increase the number of beds in intensive care, you're going to have to cut on something else, on some of the other activities. 
And this has caused a domino effect on programmed surgery for people who need that surgery. And the surgery is being bumped into the future because they don't have the capacity. And so the real problem is the collapse of the system if too many people require hospitalization. Next. Um, given the scarcity of, the, of sequences they are, there are around, and I would say particularly of Italian sequences, um, there is though some evidence from Germany, there was this recent correspondence published in the New England, which suggests next that this, um, uh, of course, was uh, a person who had uh, underlying conditions, but it was missed as probably one of the index cases in Europe, which determined then a series of outbreaks, including the uh, Italian one. Next. A few words about the dog. I think that this was an occasional finding, so uh, I don't think that this story should, should make us worry about what it does in dogs, but certainly this virus is very close to its animal progenitor, okay? So being so close to its animal progenitor means that it can easily reinfect animals. So I would not exclude that soon we will have to manage problems like, uh, okay, so you have a pet and the pet gets infected. What do you do with the pet? What do you do with the grandmother who is at home with a pet? What do you do with your children? I mean, it opens a whole, re a whole new category of issues that we are at least going to have to think of next. So yes, our pets in the picture, uh, we don't know. Is there a possibility that this virus will spell, spill back? Mm -hmm. I think so. But next. Mm -hmm. And we have to keep in mind that there's not only domestic animals, but there's also wild animals. And let's not forget this virus did originate from a wildlife reservoir. Next. Uh, one, let's see, the silver lining, of this story is that the Chinese have actually stated that they will um, look into and invest into how to uh, protect their wildlife <coughs> and how to avoid that the wildlife uh, becomes uh, a, a big risk for public health. Because of course, as I said from day one, this virus was in a bath in the forest only four months ago, and that's where it should have stayed. It shouldn't have leaked into another population and then into another population. What about the birds? Birds? birds. They, they are in the, yeah, they go to birds. And, and are they uh, also Can I just happen? finish and then we'll take questions at the end, next. And so the spillover risk, next, is there. And just because you don't see it, it doesn't mean it, it doesn't exist. We are animals. From the point of view of a virus, I assure, I can assure you that we are all animals. He doesn't care if we have a brain for those of us who have it next. <laughs> and if you can activate this, and this is uh, a little movie that sh you see the date is up there on top, you see the clock. So this is 26 January, uh, beginning of February. Bang, and that's when Europe starts. And uh, I think we can just look at it and respect its power. And uh, in my sleepless nights, I think how many scientists, how many virologists, Sonia, would have ever said that the next pandemic was going to be caused by a coronavirus? Who would have ever said that? No one. I mean, no one. This was completely off everybody's radar screen, right? Why? Also because coronaviruses do not cause very serious diseases anyway. And so, you know, it wasn't up there on the priority list uh, like other viruses like influenza. Next. One of the first things uh, we 
mentioned uh, last time was that this is not only a problem of animal health, uh, of human health, but it has a series of ramifications on the health systems world, worldwide. And um, I personally think that uh, Florida is a well-prepared state because you have hurricanes and so you know how to manage emergencies. But this is going to be, I think, a different emergency and it is going to need a uh, special focus because of the problem of the demographics and the aging population. Um, um, there's a gigantic economic impact and so SARS was a, 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 like a, a needle, a pin of a needle compared to this and SARS was 54 billion. I saw a figure 800 billion this is costing. There's enormous um, you know, losses in the global revenue. And of course, and I am particularly worried about the social unrest that this can bring, because when it comes to your life, your space in hospital, your bed in hospital, uh, you want that bed. And it doesn't matter if somebody gets there first, and uh, we will see what happens in the next few weeks here in the States and in, in Europe, because I am concerned that situations which are, let's say, unstable, because they are unstable, they're naturally unstable, could actually explode with this. And look at what's happening with xenophobia. I mean, when I say I'm Italian, they say, oh my God. So we've, we've, we've gone from, from keeping away from Asians and uh, to keeping away from Italians. Maybe, I don't know, I should dress up. <laughs> Something different. Next. And then with this one, I will leave the floor to Sonia Rasmussen and uh, we will be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Sonia, for being here. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk a little bit more of the clinical side of things, of what kind of effect that um, COVID-19 has on uh, people and then what kind of uh, risk factors that we see. So uh, next slide, please. So just as uh, You've already heard coronaviruses cause illnesses with a range of severity. They, everything from very mild colds, and a lot of that, a lot of what coronaviruses cause are mild colds. But two, there are three um, different viruses that have emerged in the last 20 years that have caused severe disease. One is SARS, which you've heard about, severe acute respiratory syndrome that emerged in 2002, 2003, had a very brief outbreak, but caused a lot of deaths and caused a lot of financial um, good too. Then the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, uh, which arose in the Arabian Peninsula, it's still circulating, although at a low level. And then the most recent is COVID-19, that, as you know, was previously called 2019 novel coronavirus. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, uh, COVID-19 is caused by SARS-CoV-2, and that's because the sequence is very similar, about 80% sequence similarity if you look at the sequence of the RNA for the virus that causes SARS. The incubation period is about five days with a range of two to 14 days. It seems pretty firm on the other end that it's 14 days. And the risk factors, and I'm gonna show you some details of these risk factors. I think this is what really helps guide what I think our next steps need to do. Who are the people that we really need to be sure that we protect in this um, upcoming time? Uh, in China, it seems like males are more often reported than females. There are some hypotheses that some of that is because males smoke um, a lot in China and then smokers appear to be at increased risk. Age, older people, and I'll show you clear data on that, and then underlying illness. The clinical manifestations are fairly similar to what you see with influenza, and that's why people are saying, if you haven't gotten your flu shot, it's not too late to get your flu shot, because you don't want to have to go to the hospital and be exposed for COVID-19 if, if really what you have is the flu, so, and flu can be prevented. Um, and then uh, most of the patients that have been hospitalized have had pretty severe pneumonia, bilateral pneumonia. Next slide. So how is it transmitted? It seems like it's person-to-person -person transmission with people who are in close contact um, via respiratory droplets when someone coughs or sneezes. Um, what's close contact due to six feet? Um, it appears that there may be other forms of transmission, like, um, you know, if you sneeze and there's droplets here, and then an hour later I come up and I touch things. So I actually think we need to right now assume that everything is coronavirus contaminated. I know that seems excessive, but that's why people are, the only thing that you can do really is wash your hands. 
and soap and water is better than um, than the, the gel. Um, the other thing is that there is some suggestion that there's fecal oral transmission. Certainly there is a uh, virus in stool of people that are infected. And nosocomial transmission, that is transmission in hospitals, seems to be playing a pretty significant role. And so please don't wear a mask. Please let those masks be used in healthcare settings so that they can protect our healthcare workers. In other words, we're all in trouble. If, we, if our healthcare workers don't want to come to work because they can't be protected, we're all in trouble. Next slide. So you've heard about probably a lot in the news about this R not <coughs> basic reproduction number. I never thought R not would be so sexy, but um, this is um, from NPR um, from the days of Ebola when we were all the last time we were all panicked about something, right? So um, the number of people that one sick person will infect on average, and you can see measles. You can see why it's so important to for us to keep a high level of, of measles vaccination. It has an R naught of 18. So one person, if you're, if there's an unaffected population or un, non-immune population, one person with measles can make 18 people sick. You can see Ebola was about two, HIV about four, SARS about four, mumps ten. So the current thought is that uh, that COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 has an R naught of somewhere between two and four. It seems like the numbers are shaking out. And of course, you can drop that number with different sorts of um, methods, and we'll talk about those later. Next slide. This is another thing that we used to look at this a lot with influenza, and so I, I worked for three years on pandemic preparedness. And as Alaria says, we were really preparing for a flu pandemic, not for a coronavirus pandemic. But a lot of the same things that you think about for a flu pandemic really work for a coronavirus pandemic. Um, you know, the downside is that there's not medications like there are for flu. So with flu, we could give people the um, Oseltamivir or Tamiflu, and that's not available for coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So here, this is what we looked a lot for flu pandemics. We wanted to know, you look on the, uh, the x-axis, um, how transmissible is it? And then on the y-axis, how fatal is it? And you can see that, you know, it isn't as transmissible as measles. Um, it's probably in the transmissibility rate sort of in the common cold, but it's a lot more deadly than the common cold. So um, this is why we're all concerned about this. The next one. So most of what we know is from China right now. That's where most of the papers that are published in the medical literature. And um, I feel like we have to take a little bit with a grain of salt the medical information that we get from the news. There are some things from the news that I feel like, well, it doesn't really make sense. And then you see later they published it and it didn't say at all what they said previously, so I think we have to be cautious about what's in the news. But this is a paper that was published in the CDC equivalent of CDC, the US CDC's MMWR, um, and this is the data from the first 72,000 people with um, COVID-19 in China. Next slide. So first of all, this is that difference of males and females. You can see that, so um, that number of cases, you can see there's a few more males than females as far as cases, but look at deaths. Men are much more likely to die. Is that because of smoking or is that something else? We don't know. You can see the case fatality rate in males is 2.8% where females is 1.7. And overall, you can see that 2.3%, this is for those 70,000 people in China. Um, of course, we have to take that case fatality rate really with a um, grain of salt right now. I think it could go up or it could go down. We don't really know. I think it's more likely that it's gonna go down because I think a lot of the more mild cases or asymptomatic cases are, have been missed. I haven't really seen any studies that were looking at seroprevalence, people that had antibodies, but didn't ever show any signs of disease. Next slide. So this is just something about the case fatality rate. It's the number who died divided by the total number of cases. So if you don't have all the mild cases, you're going to overestimate that. It depends on how bad is the virus. It depends on having accurate numbers of cases. And of course, we I think most times early on in an outbreak, we're missing those mild or asymptomatic cases, and that's gonna overestimate the case fatality rate. And it also depends on some very high rates we're coming out of 15% or 9% from Iran, and whether that's because they're missing the more mild cases or is it because their healthcare is different? I don't really um, know a lot about healthcare in Iran, but we have to recognize it also depends on the medical care that's been provided. And 
I think early on in China, there was some um, overwhelming of the healthcare system. We have all have had a little bit of time to prepare, but they didn't have any time to prepare at all. So their hospitals, you saw some of the news reports of their hospitals being totally overwhelmed, and that would be not the best place to get medical care. Next slide. So here is the, and really I think you don't have to look at the right side of this one, but just looking at of all those 70,000 cases that they reported, 80% of people were mildly affected. You know, they had maybe a mild fever, a little bit of cough, but they weren't severely sick. Uh, about 14% had severe illness um, where, you know, they really had to stay home, they really didn't feel well. And the, about 5% were critically ill. That means in an intensive care unit, um, needing to have mechanical ventilation, um, uh, really severely ill. And a, as you've heard, this can really quickly overwhelm uh, intensive care units and hospitals. Next slide. So this is a busy slide and I tried last night and it was just too late to try to put this in a graph, but I think the actual numbers are interesting and I'd like to you to focus. So, I'm a pediatrician and I really care about kids. You can see kids are not very often affected, or at least they're not often getting sick. Now, are they, do they have the virus and they're just not showing symptoms and then they can really infect the rest of us because we all get close to those kids, right? Um, you can see that of those 70,000 cases, um, about 0.9, this is, they actually only had age on a smaller number, so if someone's adding them all up, it doesn't add up to 70,000. But among that big group of patients that they've described, 0.9% were 0 to 9, 1.2% were 10 to 19. But what I want you to really focus on is the case fatality rate. So if you look on the right side, case fatality rate is pretty low, pretty low, pretty low. Then you get to that 50, 59 category, 1.3%, 60 to 69, 3.6%, 70 to 79, 8%, and then 80 and above, 14.8%. So you can see why CDC is starting to say elderly, and they don't say what elderly is, but I think what the more recent data are saying is 60 and above, which includes some of us in this room. Um, you know, this is something that we have to start being concerned about. So if we get this, it could be pretty severe. Next slide. What about comorbid conditions? And here you can see um, the case fatality rate really does also depend on these comorbid morbid, uh, conditions. Hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic respiratory disease, cancer. And you can see the people that had none of these, their rate was 0.9% compared to somebody that has heart disease, uh, risk of about 10%. Now, one of the things that's important to note here is this isn't um, stratified by looking at um, age. So is it that old people have more of these things, it could be. It could be that this is a lot of this is age and we need more data on this. And um, we don't, for example, have any information on immunocompromising conditions. Several people have asked me about immunocompromising conditions. I haven't seen any data on that. So that's something that we're, we, we still are in a, um, a not enough data zone. Next one. So what is clinical care? Well, there's no medications. That's what I was telling you before. And um, the, uh, the flu medications don't work for this. So care is primarily supportive. One of the most critical things when, as a physician, is making sure that you're protecting yourself and thus your <coughs> patients. So uh, infection control is really important. Care is supportive, making sure the person has enough oxygen, whether that means that they need to have oxygen in their nose or whether they have tube down their throat. There's no known therapeutics. There is one drug that is being used. Um, there are some clinical trials that have been started by the NIH, and it's also available by compassionate use um, through the company directly. Um, there is a phase one trial that's going to be launched um, by NIH. I, I put in soon because uh, initially somebody said March, and then it said April, and soon. We'll just say soon. Um, people say, oh, when's that virus, when's that vaccine going to be ready? And um, I think. You know, Tony Fauci, I would listen to Tony Fauci, he's saying 12 to 18 months. I think that's, that makes uh, good sense for it to be widely available. There'll be a vaccine sooner, but it won't have been tested for safety and make sure that it actually prevents the disease and have enough for everybody and for everywhere, uh, 12, everywhere for 12 to 18 months at least. Next slide. So testing, initially it was only available at CDC. You know that there have been some issues with the testing at CDC. 
it's now available at state public health labs. And then yesterday, a couple of the big testing companies um, started doing testing themselves, which uh, will definitely increase the ability, but also we're gonna see a huge jump in the number of cases. I think we've not been seeing large numbers of cases because such small numbers were being tested. I saw a number yesterday that only 2,000 people in the US have been tested. So, um, and this is something you can test with a swab, either a nasopharyngeal swab or a throat swab or a lower respiratory sample. You can also test blood and stool and other things. Next slide. So I just wanna talk about some of these um, things that people talk about. You know, I'm on quarantine, I'm on isolation. Isolation is if you're sick and you're isolated so you don't make other people sick. Quarantine is, is if you've been exposed to someone who has been sick, or you've been on the been on a cruise ship or something, and um, that's mm -hmm. to keep you from giving it to somebody else when you're in that early stage that you might not be showing symptoms, but you could spread it. So monitoring to see if that person becomes sick, and that also can limit the spread. Next slide. So infection control. This is really going to be tough, and there have been uh, healthcare workers that died in China. There will be healthcare workers, I'm certain, that will die in the United States. Absolutely. Um, healthcare yeah. workers. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's really hard. It's really hard as a physician when you're working really hard. It's very important just, you know, obviously it's not like the moon suits that people were in with Ebola, but it, even this, you need to have uh, goggles, and goggles, they get all, all um, sweaty and you can't see because they get uh, foamed up and um, then uh, the NIOSH approved N95, those you can't breathe very well with, a gown, gloves, it's hot, you just, by the end you want to take it off. It's really important the order in which you take it off, so people need to practice donning it, putting it on, and doffing it, and taking it off in an appropriate way so that they don't contaminate themselves. So it's tricky. And the other thing is mild infections are difficult to identify. So if you have someone that comes in with just a little bit of sniffles, you know, you're going to say, well, it's a cold. And it could very well be COVID-19. And there are limited resources for isolation of cases and quarantine of close contacts. And, and we really need to be working on training our healthcare workers to make sure that they know to, how to put on that PPE, the personal protective equipment appropriately. Next slide. So travel advisories. There are still travel advisories. I think soon we're going to be at the point that you know, people aren't going to want people from the United States. <laughs> you know, I think, I think, you know, how quickly you go from a country that's trying to protect itself to just having to take care of yourself. So right now, these are the current, as of last night, the travel advisories that are in place, China, Iran, South Korea, and Italy, and then level two is Japan. Next slide. Um, I just want to note that these, this is a big deal. There have only been five public health emergencies of international concern since the WHO started doing this. This is the fifth one. The other one is Ebola, Zika, H1N1, and then the polio resurgence in 2014. <coughs> Next slide. So I think given that we don't have pharmaceutical interventions, we don't have medications, we don't have vaccines, what are we left with? we're left with non-pharmaceutical interventions. And I think that's where we're gonna be at over the next few weeks here in the United States, um, as what we've seen in Italy and in China. Um, we've done the border screenings, closures, isolation of sick, quarantine of the exposed, but I think we really are going to be very soon at the situation of camps and mass gatherings. When there's community transmission, there's no reason to have, sorry, sort fans, but there's no reason to have everybody in the O-Dome um, you know, Together. coughing and sneezing <laughs> and shaking each other's hands, um, decreasing use of public transportation, closing of schools, making schools go to virtual, and I was really pleased to see UF um, move towards that yesterday, and then increasing telework options for people that it's a possibility. And of course, we really want to encourage people to stay home when sick, and but we know that a lot of people don't have sick leave, and if they don't if they stay home, they don't get paid. And so um, we need to change that too. Next slide. So since I love pregnancy things, I'm just gonna to talk to you a little bit. We just published a paper on COVID-19 and pregnancy. There's only two case series right now. Um, there were 18 pregnancies, 19 deliveries. Um, all of these baby, these moms were infected in the third trimester. So we don't really have data on the, what happens in the first and second trimester. 
the babies seem to do pretty well, although some of them were born preterm because they, um, um, uh, the moms were sick. And um, so you can see preterm birth in six. All of these were, almost all were born, I think 16 of 18 were born by C-section. And there was no evidence of intrauterine transmission. So, you know, like Zika, where the virus goes from the mom to the baby um, across the placenta, there's no evidence of that yet. I think this number of cases is not enough to say for sure. Um, people have been asking a lot about breastfeeding. There's only been six breast milk samples that have been tested. They didn't show any virus, but again, I think six is not enough for me to want to base a policy on whether it's safe to breastfeed or not. Next slide. And then I think one of the important things um, is uh, why are so few children affected? And there, I was reading, there is one paper that talks about maybe the kids were less likely to be exposed. They weren't out as much in public um, early on. I don't know if that's really the reason. Is it because there's decreased infection? Because it, then there has been this hypothesis that's been out there in the literature that kids in China are exposed to a lot of coronaviruses. Kids here are, joint, are exposed to a lot of coronaviruses with cold and that maybe, maybe they have some increased immunity that is uh, protective against coronaviruses. Or it could be, and I, I think the third one, I think is something we really need to consider is, are, do kids just not get sick from it? But do they, and you certainly saw the change of how people get sick as they get older. Um, if kids become infected, and, but they don't become sick, they can really uh, be a source of transmission in the community. So um, I think we don't know which one of these it is right now, and, and we need to be doing studies to try to figure that out. And that is going to require seroprevalence studies, trying to see what kind of antibodies these kids had. There is one report of a kid, uh, six-month-old kid, that had very high viral load and showed no symptoms at all. So we know at least some kids can have very high virus levels and um, not be sick at all. So that's fine. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. My partner in crime. Yes. <laughs> so thank you. Let's stop Okay, so we have, let me just tell you where we are. We have 206 people connected. We have, Rania is collecting questions. So I would, we have 20 minutes. And so I would take maybe a couple of questions from the room and then maybe we can start looking at the ones that come down and we can, so. We have. Uh, I, I asked earlier about the possibility of birds being carrier of this virus. And I don't think this is a major issue. There's no, uh, no information about this. But uh, the other one that bothers me is that I stayed in Seattle, Washington for one month. I mean, on vacation. Not, not yet. The, uh, the announcement of virus is not. There's the biggest market for, for, for Chinese, for all kinds of nationalities plug in in that market and buy their food. But it's I not food know. born. It's not food born. Okay, but I'm one, one, one thing to say is the contact, your contact for, for people that goes in that market. They're copying, they're whatnot, you know, okay. what is the possibility of that? Instead but you have to close the market. Down. That's yeah. what you're saying. Close the market. Exactly. Okay. That's what I'm well, saying. that is one of the measures of I mass say, gathering. Yes, mass, ga mass mm -hmm. gathering. And I didn't have a picture of this, but some of you posted mm -hmm. this on the news that what we're trying to do is really flatten that curve. If we have a big bump in the number of cases all at once, we won't have enough hospital beds. And so we're trying to do everything we can to have the curve be much flatter. And it might be that that means we're having this longer, we're having this illness in our community longer, but it's within the possibility of being able to still take care of very sick patients that are showing up. And we know that there will be very sick patients. A question about, uh, no one's talked about South Korea today. Uh, they have probably a better healthcare system. They, from what I understand, have done lots of testing. I don't know if the testing is as valid. So is that a good source of data to get a sense of what's, what's really going on here? You know, there are almost no papers published yet, and I'm not sure if it's just so quick. Stuff started coming out of China just like that. Lots and lots of papers from China. I looked last night, I was trying, we were submitting a paper this morning <coughs> about children, and I thought, well, let's see if there's any data from China. I, I mean, from 
South Korea. I couldn't find any data on children from South Korea. So I think there's been a lot fewer papers. And as I said, I've been focused on papers that are that have been published in the medical literature that have gone through at least some sort of peer review, although some of them the peer review seems to be going pretty quick these so. days. <laughs> And can I ask one thing about, uh, can I ask, can I add one thing about Korea, that South Korea, actually, because all the Italians are there looking at the graphs, right, of how this peak moves, and what they say is, we are doing worse than South Korea, right, and so you compare the health systems, you compare the population health, and it doesn't look that different, but what the, Co the South Koreans did was they started using technology. And they started using technology for distancing and for isolation and for managing quarantine. And so the lockdown they put in was not like, uh, let's say, totalitarian lockdown. lockdown it was an, um, like a, a lockdown which engaged the people and they could also be checked, spot check, like, you know, where are you? Are you, you know, you shouldn't be here at this time. And actually, I think that that is a way, I mean, it's not the authorities that are going to fix this. It's the people who need to understand that they are part of the solution as well as part of the problem. And so because things move so fast, information can be misunderstood and so and so and so and so, we need to make sure that the population understands that this is their problem as well. And so as Sonia says, you can't, take all the masks because the doctors need them because if the doctors don't have the mask they will get sick and if they will get sick that problem of the beds is not only going to be linked to the beds but it's also going to be linked to not having enough doctors so there was our generation z question so mass gatherings all across the board are being canceled postponed do you see this being a prevalent issue in say the next six months we even looked here in florida and it's like graduation well if people from all over florida come to one spot for a weekend and going back to their corner of Florida, or even bigger at the Olympics, people from around the world come to this one spot and then back to their respective corners. So do you see these bigger events that everyone's looking for as being canceled, like graduation, Olympics, so on and so forth? I think it's really hard to have a crystal ball right now to know what's gonna happen. Um, it does look like China, it's kind of, they really dampened it down. Now China has more imported cases from other countries than exported. So, you know, they, but they were, they were pretty totalitarian of nobody moving out at all. So will the, will the people in the United States, and I think, I personally think what you say is right. This is a people thing, not a, people in the United States don't respond well to people telling them what to do. But I think we all have to say we're in this together. And if we want to protect our grandparents and parents, the way to do it is to, to try to avoid mass gatherings, try, try to decrease the places that we're in too much contact. So, but it's, I think it's really hard to predict how long it's gonna take. So I, I, I think we can look at some other countries and take a guess, but I think it's, I think, I personally think it's really hard to predict. And is it gonna come back in the fall? I have no idea. I heard somebody from Emory give a talk, uh, I guess a week ago, and he said, you know, if I knew that, I'd be playing Vegas, you know? I mean, because I, I just think it's really hard right now to guess what, this is a brand new virus. We, we have looked at flu viruses for years and we had lots of models. This is not a flu virus, so. I'm also, uh, you know, worried about the impact of this virus uh, spreading in the campus, especially being uh, shutting down lectures because uh, to, uh, to protect the professor and also the students and what would that I mean we are in the critical phase now mm -hmm. we are towards the end almost end of the semester mm -hmm. and that's very very critical mm -hmm. I know and but this is a pandemic we, okay. and so, you, so look so you're not gonna we're not gonna stop it I <laughs> promise look we are re we really try but we're not gonna stop it nobody's gonna stop it so this is an extraordinary event of global proportions. And so to an extraordinary event, you need to react with extraordinary measures. And if graduation has to be postponed to another time, it's gonna to have to be postponed. I mean, I would be very fearful of pushing a mass gathering like that with the demographics of Florida. I mean, it's just crazy. It's crazy because there's so if many- there's so many transmission at that time. No. Yes, yes, yeah. well, of course. I mean, if, if the infection 
continues to grow in numbers and there is still active transmission, that's a, a very big risk for a very big number of people, a lot of which are either, in the, let's say they're over 60s, because all the parents come and the family, and, and so it is what it is. And it's modifications. Online courses are possible. We know universities all the time. I have to tell you, at the medical school, um, a lot of the students don't show up. They do everything online. So, um, you know, the first two years, they do almost everything online. They watch it. They put it on double time. We don't talk fast enough for them. And, you know, so, so you know, I think online courses are possible. People can learn through that that option. I think there are ways to do this. Other universities have figured out ways to do it. We need to, too. So let's see. Yes, there was I, a question. Just a question. I'm Italian, but don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here, here. here before Christmas. Um, <laughs> you know, my question is, um, from my knowledge regarding the, um, the flu, and normally the flu is going down when basically the epidemic, I mean, whenever I mean the people, uh, is infected around like a 10, 15 percent of them. So I know that this is probably nothing that we do not know yet. But can you guess that you know that would be the numbers? Um, imagining that you know this, we want to you know this coronavirus going down, right? Because I I have my family in Italy, so I would like to go. I cannot move right now. But you know, just you know, looking at the numbers that uh, usually. That the ones for the flu, meaning that the flu is going down in, you know, with numbers, whenever I mean the 10 or 15 percent of people is infected. Do you think that the coronavirus could be the same rule? I'm not much of a speculator. I, I, I just don't know. Because we, just we, know are, so we have about now 7,000 people infected in Italy, but we are already more, 50. More. 56 million. So, no, in no, all no, the wait, two. Can I interrupt you? So, we don't have 7,000 people in Italy. We have 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, or 1 million. We don't so know. We don't know, we don't know because there's no serological test. So, there's no way that we can say that I have been in Italy, I was in, the, in Italy in the early February, have contracted that virus. <laughs> 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 there is no way to understand the yeah. denominator, yeah. how many people contracted that infection yes. in a non-symptomatic way, mm -hmm. in a mild way, or did not seek any medical advice, yeah. or did not. So how we don't we have not that number. Uh -huh. And without that, well, now you we cannot cannot predict predict now, now we not going. Epidemic, we'll be going down. Right. Yeah, so that's the number you need. Do we want to take a few questions from you? Yeah, so I'm getting a few questions about fomites. So people are concerned about fruit at the grocery store, clothing, mm -hmm. mail, that kind of stuff. Do we have any information on the types of services of the virus? Okay, can I? Yes. So I was I was criticized this morning by a friend of mine because I get all these tweets saying, how much does the virus resist on the table, on the handle, on on uh, phone, you know? And I answered, I said, I we just don't know. And I got screamed at because that wasn't what I should have said. But the truth is that we don't know. And to do that, you need to take virus, right, the strain. You need to dilute it up to 10 to the 9. And then you need to do replicates of how much the vi you put the virus on the table and you leave it for 10 minutes and then you test it. And then another batch for 20 minutes, for one hour, for 24 hours at 5 degrees, 20 degrees, 25 degrees, 37 degrees. And then it takes a year. It takes a year to do this. So I'm sorry my, my response was a bit short and too, but it, we don't know. We don't know. We need, we need to, to actually provide the funds to do research on this. We don't know. What about um, cleaning? So I had somebody ask about sodium chloride and vinegar. <laughs> what kind of things do you recommend? Yeah, the CDC website has some um, has a link to I think EPA is who actually does this. The CDC website has some links to that talks about what disinfectants should be the best. Um, do we know just in general about coronaviruses and maybe just in particular about mutations, like, or how worried are we about 
uh, like getting more severe or changing. So this is the question of the questions, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sonia is looking what time it is because she yeah, doesn't want to answer this question. Yeah, I'm because my, I'm getting a yeah, phone call. <laughs> no, so I thought she was going to leave me with this. So we don't know. Uh, so viruses mutate naturally mm -hmm. as they infect the population. So we have to understand what we mean by mutation. Okay, mutation is something that occurs, and these viruses change. What that question means is. Is the virus going to become any more virulent? Is it going to acquire like uh, an instruction inside its genome that it can go bang straight to your lower lungs? Right. This is what the question is. I think we cannot exclude it. However, as as from our animal work, okay, because we are animals, we can say that coronaviruses as they spread in animal populations they attenuate and this is something that happens with other viruses as well mm -hmm. and so adaptation in animal species is let's say closer to uh, milder symptoms um, will it become a virus that cause a, that causes by itself a necrotizing pneumonia or hemorrhagic pneumonia i don't know that there are any coronaviruses with this transmissibility that can do that, but we are learning as we go. It's, uh, we are learning. Uh, yeah. So there have been a lot of comparisons to this virus with influenza, and a lot of people are saying it's no worse, or are we overreacting? Can you comment on that comparison? What do you think about this? I think the best thing, if, she, if you put that slide that she had with, with the pink box, if you can go back, I think that you can talk showing the influence because that I thought was a very, very good slide. It's, it's the, uh, it's this one, one. Yeah. from the New York Times. So you can see that um, it is more severe and, from what we know, more severe and more transmissible than seasonal flu. Um, we mm -hmm. know that, in, and as I told you, this case fatality rate, I think it is going to move. I think we need data to tell us. I don't think we can go by our hunches, but I think it is going to change. I think it will likely drop. But even if you say it's 1% instead of that 2% that they were saying in China, that's still at least 10 times more than seasonal flu. So seasonal flu is important. It kills a lot of people every year in the United States. People think it's no big deal. People don't get the flu shot, don't really understand that. We get the flu shot we every flu. year. All our My family children. gets the flu shot yes. every year. Yes, but um, you know, and, and but this is something we don't have a vaccine, and we don't have any medications. I guess the other thing about seasonal flu is we have a medication. So this we don't have a medication to treat. So we really are are just doing supportive care. Can I just for the people in the room because this means something to us but not to many of us. So flu goes from here. That's flu. That's flu. That that's flu. That's flu. Mm -hmm. So when we say this syndrome can be defined as an influenza-like syndrome, yeah. right? So it's not like a mystery, right? It's an influenza-like syndrome caused by a coronavirus. This is the area of uncertainty. You know, the virus could, could position itself with reference to the fatality rate in here, which is between seasonal flu, swine flu, Spanish flu, and bird flu. Actually, I think it's more on the lower side of the flu. Right. And, and the possibility that those that are affected becomes worse and worse and worse, and they become now an uh, instrument of spreading, mm -hmm. sharing the virus to the other non-affected individuals. Yes, but and you can see here that the two other the two other viruses that the other two other severe coronaviruses that we know about SARS and MERS are both um, have a lot higher fatality rate. MERS is about thirty seven percent, and SARS was nine point six. Yeah. Question: I know we're running out of time. How big is public opinion views about this virus? Because the news, as you probably know, is freaking out, and you know, people are starting to from laughing about it, making jokes of the name to. Oh no, this is bad. I'm going to take this all the toilet paper from Publix. It's <laughs> very unfortunate. Uh, how big is just the public opinion and the views of this virus changing? How your response to it? Are people, people obviously are kind of over freaking out? What's warranted? What isn't? 
Yeah, it's funny because I, I saw something yesterday that I think the bottom line is to tell people, don't panic. We can do this, but we have to all be in it together. Mm -hmm. We have to do what is going to help to protect our, um, well, XM 61, so us, <laughs> but, you know, our grandparents and our parents, and we need to do what we can to protect those people with underlying conditions, people that are older, that are at significantly increased risk. And I, I believe our public health experts CDC and the state health department will help us determine what those things are. I don't think at that point we need to roll our eyes and say, well, that doesn't apply to me. I think we need to do it. And I think, um, but I don't think this is something to panic. I think most people, it will be mild. You see 80% of people is mild. It's just um, none of us want someone else to be severely sick either. So, um, and we know that um, anybody can get severely sick. Even children can be severely sick. So. And in many, many, many cases, it is non-symptomatic. So it's not only the symptomatic patients that spread it. It is also non-symptomatic people. But you stop the people who have symptoms because you can see them. They have fevers. So they say, okay, stay home. If you're non-symptomatic, you would have to do it random, <laughs> which doesn't make sense. So I think our time is up. So any questions that haven't been answered, I'll do my best to put together a frequently asked questions uh, sheet and answer them and post them on our website. So look for that later. And this talk is uh, going to be available on our website together with the previous two. And uh, we, if we're not in lockdown, <laughs> We could do an update <laughs> in a couple of weeks. Or we, just do, or I think we can do it virtually. We yep. do the virtual, we'll do the virtual update. Okay? This is very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, 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 Italiani. I'm sure there's lots of Italiani that are here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, five times. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, you know, I'm not going to study both. As soon as there's, you know, there's like a, the, the, the least important case, the financial implications. I mean, if I catch them all, it's like $8 billion. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's the least important. And there's all these logistic issues. There's a disappointment.